Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here are your hosts, Monica Profit and Tracy Hazard. Hey everyone, welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Tracy Hazard, and I'm really excited today to have Dr. Larry Sanger on the show. Um, he and I were on Larry King Live, uh, Larry King Now, it's, that's what it's called, um, together on the panel, and uh, he wraps up my having all the panelists on. And I'm excited to have him because, uh, you know, it, he's got a really interesting life here. He's got an interesting career path. He's best known as Wikipedia's co-founder. He has started or helped start many educational and reference websites, Newpedia, Encyclopedia of Earth, Watch, Know, Learn, Reading Bear, InfoBit, and most recently, Everopedia, which, has joined, which he's joined as Chief Information Officer. He has a philosophy PhD, and his dissertation is concerned the theory of knowledge. Wow, that's broad. Sanger has also written and spoken about the philosophy of the internet, which I love to talk about today, and online communities, social media in specifics. And he currently lives in Ohio with his wife and two homeschooled boys. Larry, thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. So you founded Wikipedia. And I mean, I don't know too many of us who haven't, uh, you know, trafficked the pages, used it. I don't actually know a ton of people who write on the pages, though. How is that that I haven't come across that? Uh, yeah, there's a lot more people who use it than who have actually contributed to it. Um, why is that the case? Well, uh, there's a lot of different theories. Um, one is simply that um, it requires a little bit of technical know-how to use the the markup language that, that wikis are written in. It's not difficult, right? It just puts some people off, I think. And, and actually, there's a lot more people who have made one edit. Have you ever made one edit on I Wikipedia? I haven't, actually. Which not even I a single one. Okay, have. okay, that's fine. That's fine. A lot of people have, though. A lot of people. Like, um, millions and millions. But they don't make many more than that. And I think part of the reason is they, they come away from the experience um, feeling like this is very geeky very wonky <laughs> it, it it isn't for them and and if they if you have very much experience interacting with the wikipedia community you'll you'll find that it's it's a kind of a weird place um the people have a, a an alphabet soup of rules um and a, a, a sort of bureaucratic sounding um procedures uh, and, and regulations that really don't um, get applied consistently all the time. Um, and uh, it, it can be very off-putting for a lot of people um, to have- Are you have changing the, that with, what, the, with Everipedia? What's that? Are you changing that with Everipedia? Yeah. So um, Everipedia is uh, already right now uh, a lot more opening, a lot more welcoming. I think that's a reflection on the, basically the founders. They're a lot more easygoing, um, younger guys, uh, much more tolerant of all kinds of different articles and interests and so forth. Um, and uh, more than that, uh, especially beginning um, next month, I think, uh, we will launch the new front end of the site. And this, I'm very excited about this, actually. Um, it's, uh, uh, right now we have a WYSIWYG interface. What you see is what you get. So you don't have to use that sort of um, editing uh, markup. Uh, and it's that, going to be- the, What you're referring to is the complications on the wiki side, right? Exactly. So, yeah. 
it's going to be even easier on Everpedia because it'll be as easy to edit a, an Everpedia page as it is to edit a Medium page. And right now, as we speak, um, we are going through uh, user testing and putting final touches on uh, a lot of the features. So it's going to be really exciting. It will be the first time that you have uh, a wiki encyclopedia with a blockchain backend um, that is as easy to edit as uh, Medium or the new WordPress. So this sort of, if you've ever edited these sites, um, they, they divide content into chunks, right? Um, and then you can apply different si uh, styles to each chunk. And um, yeah, I, I publish a, a column in, in Medium all the time on, yeah. uh, for podcasters. And, um, and yeah, it's super simple. You're right. It's like, oh, you want, oh, this is a subtitle. Oh, this is a headline. Oh, this is body copy. Like, it's right. super easy. Let's add an image. Like, there is no exactly. way you could mess that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and but now we're going to be doing that. Um, but it's also going to be uh, collaborative. You know, so, and it will be real time collaboration too. So you'll actually, in the same way that you can see somebody else's edits going on as you do on um, uh, Google Docs, um, you'll be able to see somebody else editing the text in the article. Uh, so yeah. it's, it, it, nobody has ever uh, redesigned wiki software this way before. And uh, as a as a wiki connoisseur, as somebody who's like used a number of different wiki uh, software, you know, tools, um, I'm I'm pretty excited about what the team has put together. Well, you know, it's interesting. So you talked about it having a blockchain backend, and of course, you know, that's what we talk about here. Why? Yep. Why was that the choice? There's a, a couple of different reasons. Um, several, actually. Um, initially, we were running ads on the site. This is before I joined the company. So I'm not a, I'm not a co-founder, um, but I joined actually when, when uh, we moved to the blockchain because I saw the huge potential of um, putting it on the blockchain. Before that though, um, we were running ads and uh, we were disappointed with uh, the way it looked. And, and we thought that if it's really gonna take off, then we've gotta get rid of that and think of a different business model. Um, and so part of it is just driven by, by the notion that, hey, if we uh, tokenize the uh, editing of, of encyclopedic content, um, we will uh, be able to basically pay ourselves in tokens and, um, and we'll be doing the, the community uh, a justifiable service in maintaining the software and, and so forth. In addition, though, um, this... Uh, is even more importantly, I think, from the community point of view, we are incentivizing the editing of an encyclopedia. Um, we're not like paying people to write because it is a blockchain. They're interacting with the blockchain using smart contracts, of course. Um, so you are actually mining uh, tokens for yourself by uh, writing, an, writing an encyclopedia article or editing somebody else's encyclopedia article. So um, that that's going to be interesting uh, to see what sort of ultimate impact that has on, on motivation levels of, of people contributing to an encyclopedia. One of the reasons why it was difficult to motivate a lot of experts to participate in the predecessor of Wikipedia called Newpedia is that a lot of prof a lot of professors expected when they write encyclopedia articles, which is one thing that they do, um, they expect to be paid, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's also, I think, one of the reasons why a, a lot of, of uh, high-ranking uh, professionals just don't spend that much time on on Wikipedia too. It's just it's not remunerative, um, and they've got other better things to do with their time, I guess. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, and so now does the blockchain also help? Because you were talking about that there's this complex set of rules on Wikipedia that yeah. not, are not always equally applied. And so yeah. is that, you know, is that part of the blockchain is building in that ability to trust that the rules are being applied? Um, 
Yes and no. At least right now, that's the way it works. Okay, so um, right now, editorial decisions are are being made by the uh, the Everpedia community using the blockchain. Um, so if uh, if a new uh, submission contains copyrighted material, then we'll have it taken down. We'll downvote it, and we we have a. a fairly straightforward process. We don't need to debate about it, although we can, right? We have the tools um, and it, those tools are going to get even better, but we don't have to. We can just vote it down and that's generally what happens. Um, there have been any number of people who have tried to uh, put massive amounts of encyclopedic content uh, onto uh, uh, Everpedia um, that it was easy to see was plagiarized from elsewhere. Um, looks encyclopedic, but we don't allow plagiarism. Um, so, so in other uh, words, you're not duplicating what's already out there, what's already out there on Wikipedia or in other places. You want new right. content. Exactly, exactly. Um, so uh, that is definitely another one of the advantages. Um, going forward in a new phase of development, though, um, we want to keep the the bar of of uh, of inclusion high enough only to to get rid of the really obviously uh, bad stuff like uh, copyright infringement and and um, perhaps uh, you know libel and and uh, some other legally actionable stuff. Um, and keep the, the bar low enough that there can be multiple competing articles on different subjects. So one of the great advantages, so this, this is to continue answering your previous question, you know, what is the purpose of putting it on the blockchain? Um, well, uh, we want it to be decentralized. We don't just want to have a back end for everpedia.org. Um, it's not just a database for a single website. Um, we want to create a network, an encyclopedia network. So one of the first things that I did when I joined the company was to reach out to um, some people that I knew uh, from my time building different reference works um, at other uh, encyclopedias and just ask them, would you be interested in contributing uh, some or all of your stuff to, uh, to the Everpedia network? And they said, yes. They were actually, uh, uh, one, one person was quite enthusiastic and wanted to put all of their stuff, um, you know, as soon as it's possible. Um, another person said, sure, we could do that. Maybe we'll come up with a, a program. Um, and uh, another person was, was interested in, in, you know, auto-generating certain kinds of reference articles, which I think really would be useful. Um, so we're, we're in the process now of, of uh, putting the final touches on the first phase of the development. And then uh, later this year, we will uh, begin the uh, second phase of development in earnest, which will support, as I say, multiple competing articles. Now, that means that there can't, we can't actually use the blockchain as, uh, as a strict editorial mechanism because different sources are going to have different editorial policies and that's as it should be. And we really need to respect that, especially if we're going to um, support a, an international audience, right? right. Um, where different there's roles, radically different, different ideas, right? Yeah. I, I, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to want to uh, allow, you know, the, the, uh, you know, a communist China, if they want to um, uh, put, put a, a, a state, uh, approved encyclopedia on the blockchain if they want to, um, alongside, you know, um, I, I don't know, libertarian encyclopedias or, or whatever. Um, they're definitely going to have different ideas about what is correct and what, well, uh, know, what should pass muster. Yeah, so you're bringing up actually, you know, in some ways, the, you know, there is the difference going on. Is that going to be really apparent? Is that going to be transparent to, um, to us as, you know, readers of that? Is the difference? Well, I, I would hope so. I think so, right? I mean, so, okay, one, one logistical difficulty we're going to have to deal with um, coming, going forward is actually identifying when two different articles are actually about the same subject. Because 
well, is it going to be just based on the title of the article? Maybe, but there's going to be slightly different versions, you know, like, so there's going to be like uh, one article might be, I don't know, George W. Bush and another one might be uh, George Bush Jr. Or I don't know what, uh, you know, it's slight variants on names. Um, and, and, uh, and then, you know, how do you decide uh, if, if they really are articles about the same thing? Okay, so then once, you, once you've decided that, then there's going to be presumably different front ends. Everpedia.org will be one of them, but you could make an app based on this same data. It's going to be, you know, open content and, and on available via IPFS, right? Um, so you'll be able to make a page that uh, concerns one topic, say God, and there will be articles from lots of different sources about God, all linked from the same page. Um, and uh, one thing that I'm really excited about, actually, um, and this is yet another advantage of, of uh, putting it on the blockchain, um, is, is the idea that if it's totally decentralized and the, the entire project is mediated through a, a neutral protocols, essentially, um, then it's much more likely that you can motivate people to spend the time, the significant amount of time, to rate the different articles. Because it, it, just imagine if you wanted to create a, a global project to rate all the encyclopedia articles in the world, um, it would be difficult to motivate people to do the hard work of actually reading an article and then putting a number on it, going out on a limb and, and doing that. Um, I think the only way you could motivate people to, to participate in that pro program is if they they knew the data was going to be open content, which is the content version of open source. It can be shared um, and, and redeveloped by anyone uh, uh, as, as at will, basically. Um, and then, um, yeah, uh, I, I think having it decentralized is going to make it possible for people to, uh, to work together in this way um, on a, a global competition basically to find the best versions of of um, each uh, the best articles basically on each topic um, and also from every point of view especially if we again enable people to identify themselves uniquely and then share information about themselves so that you could say according to just the christians what is the best article about god or according to just the muslims what's the best article about god and then it'd be really interesting to compare the two but it it's only be. the blockchain that would actually allow that thing that sort of thing to happen i i argue <laughs> so uh, is there some <clears throat> excuse me is there some amount of machine learning going on to sort of find those and compare and contrast the articles to, as you were pointing out, you could have President George Bush and George W. Bush, like right. how do you bring them together? And so is that, is that maybe a future plan part of it to ha try to help uh, bring those together and find them for you? Because, sure. you know, yeah. hopefully your community will, but it doesn't always, right? Right. No, that's, that's right. I mean, and, and certainly we'll, we'll have different, uh, um, tools that will enable people to um, identify similar articles and and uh, do all kinds of a thing, other things like um, find. Uh, we we've been talking about uh, how we can use tools. Um, uh, maybe we'll we'll even buy a subscription to a tool or the uh, tools that already exist that uh, locate uh, the test um, submissions for for um, uh, copyright violation. Mm, so, yeah, there are some yeah. out there. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about, you know, what's going on. So there's been uh, lots of uh, controversy about Wikipedia, for instance, and that there are systematic, I'm going to call it scraping of information and data and other things like that out of articles and other places. What, what are you putting in place to prevent that so that the data is more trustworthy, so that we aren't pulling out all references to, I don't know, I think the, the article I read was pulling out references to climate change and, and crazy stuff like that. Um, well, uh, again, I, the, the bar for inclusion is going to be pretty low. Um, 
if somebody uses government data, for example, and matches it up to create a reference work um, that's actually useful, but it is derivative, um, I'm not sure that, that uh, if it's significantly different from other things that are on offer, then um, we'll allow it. Um, one of the big questions, actually, that we are going to have to answer I think in the next couple of months, actually, and we've already been started talking about this, um, is uh, for those several active projects that are working on on versions of Wikipedia articles, not necessarily working on Wikipedia and contributing back to Wikipedia, but who have forked particular articles. So we have done that, actually. Um, and, and we're not the only ones, but we're probably the biggest. Um, well, in that case, um, how do we determine um, what, which version of the article um, we want to keep in the resource? Or do we want to actually support all of them and then allow the users to determine what they think is the best version? But even in that case, you know, we, if that's the case, then we would need to be able to automatically identify when um, a couple of articles are so similar um, and yet legitimate, so there aren't. It isn't just copyright violation, right? Um, that, but they're they're similar, so we want to group them together. Right. You can you can see if you're actually trying to catalog all the encyclopedia articles in the world, um, especially in a world that supports open content um, and forking of content. In other words. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's going to end up being kind of complicated. Uh -huh. Hopefully yeah. not complicated for the end user, though. You know what? This is complicated as a writer. So I write a column for Inc. Magazine. I write a column for Authority Magazine. Mm -hmm. So between those two, and, you know, this is the the part that's difficult as a writer in general is that you have an inherent bias. I mean, I, I you know, there's no way around that. It just happens that you have a viewpoint um, the people that you choose to interview and is, are, happen to be the people that you meet. That's exactly how it happened with you. You know, I, we, we ended up in the same circle on the same panel and now I, I'm interviewing you. So mm -hmm. it's sort of who you run across. So it is in your circles. So that mm -hmm. inherent bias comes with writing. It comes with the process of, of journalism in general. And mm -hmm. so when you're, when you're, it, it's there. So how can we make that more apparent, but still more trustworthy? So for instance, I write about innovation specifically product launching, but I have 27 years of experience doing that. Mm -hmm. So my writing about it is a whole lot more um, deep knowledge than someone who's been an Amazon seller for three years, for instance. Yeah. Uh -huh. So right. Okay. So how do you how do you bring that out? How do you bring out what's what's more trustworthy? What's deeper knowledge? I mean that that's a judgment call. That's hard. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's 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 two things I want to comment on there. Um, first of all. Uh, I wrote an article called uh, "Why Neutrality," um, and and I, I'm I'm going to keep pushing this until I uh, until I die. Um, I I think there's there's three different categories of writing that um, that people uh, have a right to expect will be neutral and serve their own purposes in deciding what to believe for themselves. Um, one of them is encyclopedia articles, another is journalism, um, and the third is textbooks. Um, so these, these three things um, we, we generally do expect to be neutral. So in this paper, I actually, I actually uh, argue the opposite thesis to, to yours. It, I don't disagree with you at all that we all have, we carry biases um, and, and that's, um, you know, you can't do anything about that. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that you have to write in a biased way. Um, it no, is no, possible. you're right. You're right about that. I, like, I try very hard to make sure that we're presenting both sides or we're presenting all the information. That, that's, no. that I believe that that's the job of a journalist. But I'm also not a trained journalist. Like that's not my yeah, yeah. experience, right? I'm a trained designer, so not the same thing. So yeah. obviously, you know, when we ask when we ask, I'm going to say it, 
lay people, when we ask people who are not trained as journalists, uh -huh. do not have that background, we're asking them to write again and again today. 90% yeah. of our contributing writers to almost all of our online publications are not trained as journalists. Right, no, that's Never absolutely took a class, right. Don't know any of the rules, nothing yeah. about it. So that's right, right. It's not true. And I don't, I don't think absolutely that. Absolutely right. <laughs> I, I think when it comes to to like writing reviews and writing blog posts, there is no requirement to be to be uh, uh, unbiased. Um, uh, but I, but our true news should be. That's the idea. That's, that's what they're that's, paid. That's to all do. I'm saying. I just wanted to. I just wanted to to say that. And and um. But I, I agree. It with is you related to the second part of your question, though, right? Because because the the concern is um, uh, there are people who uh, know stuff better than other people. Yes, we call them experts, um, and and it's absolutely true. Um, uh, uh, the 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 difficulty is when the experts disagree. Um, and and there are different uh, or or uh, when a large number of experts are systematically mistaken, which has happened throughout the history of of uh, of, of uh, yeah, ideas and and uh, the history of science. Um, so uh, you know, for for a, a very long time, of course, uh, all the greatest minds thought that the uh, the Earth was the center of the universe, right? Um, and and uh, for a, a long time, one of the leading theories of uh, you know uh, what was out there in space was uh, the ether, right? Um, and uh, more recently, uh, in living memory, there uh, and even still actually, there's uh, some psychologists um, uh, who who have uh, believed that the mind is reducible to behavior. Um, when you're studying the mind, you're doing nothing but studying behavior, and there's really nothing more to it than that. All of these things are, are, are uh, expert uh, opinions, um, or expert opinions that, that the best or most knowledgeable, the people who've spent all of their lives thinking about certain things, um, were systematically wrong. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and then what do you do in the case of things like blockchain? where um, there's no way of knowing what the future is going to be like. There's no way of knowing how various things should be set up. We're, we're all kind of babes in the woods learning together. You know, um, the technology, half the technology or more than half the technology that will govern um, future blockchain systems hasn't been conceived of yet, yeah. right? Um, so, uh, so. Um, you know, so Larry, I think that the why neutrality is a really interesting way to put it because, you know, why is that important? Why is it important for decentralization for, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in social media. I mean, I, yeah. I'm, we're getting to a generation who has, who doesn't believe that anything is trustworthy, especially their textbooks, their news, mm -hmm. their encyclopedia, you know, in a sense from, from what's been reported on about Wikipedia. So they don't believe any of it anymore. So we have a, we have a different, a, a whole generation growing up. And I have, I have daughters in, I have daughters that age, range from age 24 to down to five. So, you uh -huh. know, they, they have different viewpoints on the world and, yeah. you know, this is, right. this is something that we're coming to. So your, your article spot on and sort of asking like why we need this. We do need this. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I wonder, uh, you know, I've talked to any number of young people and I know what you're saying in uh, that, uh, you know, they, they express skepticism about a lot of different things. And um, uh, as, a, as a philosophical skeptic, I, I'm sympathetic to that point of view, but there's there's uh, there's critical skepticism, and then there is uh, easy, almost anti-intellectual skepticism. I agree with that as difference. well. <laughs> yes. Yes, there's a big difference, um, and the difference is if you uh, are, are a critical skeptic, then you actually inform yourself of what is uh, uh, believed and and what has been learned, and you actually satisfy yourself on certain points that 
aren't controversial that uh, that people generally agree with, um, and you actually have developed the the um, intellectual and academic tools. You have the 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 mental wherewithal to be able to come to those conclusions um, for yourself. So I was raised to be a critical skeptic. So uh-huh. I, I was absolutely raised by my father to do that. So my, that my father's answer to everything was that you are not allowed to read one source material ever. Uh-huh. And you're not uh-huh. allowed to read derivative materials. Wow. Like you, if you find one and you, you realize that they're citing a source, you have to go to the source. Uh-huh. And so uh-huh. that's what I was raised to do. So three to five, if you didn't get three to five sources and you did, you know, then you couldn't, you couldn't form an opinion. And so that was, that was how I was raised to brought up. But that becomes, you know, what we, what I see in my daughters is that, you know, trying to encourage that is difficult for them because they start to, you know, that, that questioning happens, yeah. you know, what's, is this real? Is this source? And so we, we created a sense of they're not sure. Yeah. They don't know how to answer that I, in what's you. going on. That's really hard place to have brought them up. There's, so. there's a reason for this, and it ultimately has to do with the, the sociology of philosophy, really. That's, the, uh, that's how I would put it, basically. We, we have, uh, as a society, have embraced... Uh, a lot of the attitudes that postmodernism has has taught, um, quite frankly, um, and and uh, I mean, you you um, if you take a, a course in course moder- in postmodernism, um, two of the main tenets that you will bring away is that um, you know there uh, well as they put it there are no privileged texts, um, but uh, what that what that really means is uh, anything goes, um, you can sort of make up your own mind. And, and of course, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but the point is that there's no, uh, 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 that there aren't any, anything that can be uh, blessed with the, the title facts. Right. At all, you're just building competing holistic systems um, and, and, uh, and, and you can't do any better than that. And there is no, there's no uh, place to stand. So there's, it's uh, anti-foundationalism is mm-hmm. another way to put it. The, the foundationalist theory, now we're getting into, into epistemology, yeah. um, <laughs> says that there is, a, there, there is a firm, solid foundation somewhere, somehow, um, for our, our beliefs. Um, and and uh, if you are of a more scientific cast of mind, as I am, then, um, then you believe that that comes from um, experience. Right, um, and perhaps there's uh, certain kinds of uh, beliefs that we have that that are um, uh, innate in some sense. Um, and we can debate about that, but there's uh, but what isn't the case is that that uh, we should just believe whatever the crowd believes, or um, we we should uh, just believe uh, whatever the state or talk radio or whatever uh, tells us to believe. Um, uh, and that ultimately, uh, these, this, this view, this foundationalist view, is, uh, I, I would argue, part and partial, uh, parcel of, of the traditional notion of rationalism. Um, the notion that, that uh, by um, using our reason, we can actually uh, come to uh, reasonable or justified conclusions. Um, but if if you have no uh, place to begin, um, uh, or if if uh, you uh, begin with a place that is admittedly um, irrational, like again, you know, the party line or whatever it is, um, then then um, uh, then you're giving up a reason. And now let, let me get to the point. Now the point is, our young people have not um, been taught uh, the, the habits. Uh, they certainly haven't been taught philosophy. Uh, you know, that almost isn't, that isn't the worst part about it. The, the worst part about it is that these, these habits of thought um, that maybe you and I learned earlier in our science classes and, and um, which were encouraged in other classes, um, uh, scientific and rationalistic um, methods of thought um, have not been passed on. Um, yeah. I, 
basically, and at another big source, another reason for this is simply the way that we engage with each other in social media, the way that, that uh, and, and for that matter, journalism, right? Um, if you pick up even good journalism, uh, or, or supposedly good journalism in like The Atlantic or, or Harper's or something like that, um, which goes into depth and actually go, does get into, into some arguments, it's still lightweight, Right, and that's yeah. the that's pretty much the best that most people ever ever. Well, encounter. it's because we also have it. We have a different speed. That's part of what's going yeah. on, right? And so you have to slow down if you want to be rational. That's right. <laughs> that's right. It's yeah. a totally different speed. So yeah. you know, this is so this is so interesting, Larry, because you know we're 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 really getting at w and what has fascinated me and and is that. Everpedia has, and you've joined them with this philosophy background. Yeah. And I think that that's really, that, that shows a really depth of, of their goals, of the goals of the company, of really trying to make sure that, that we're thinking this all the way through, that we're building something that is going to be useful, that is going to be incentivized, that is going to be the trustworthy at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I basically I told the guys I, I didn't want to get on board if I wasn't able to work on that um, project that I that I described before um, competing encyclopedia articles that are rated and ranked according to different affinity groups and so forth. So what I want to see exist in in the next uh, version of, uh, of Wikipedia 2.0. <laughs> um, uh, what I want to see is the ability to compare the very best take on the topic of God um, from different points of view. So I want to see um, like the best article uh, according to Catholics versus um, you know, Sunni Muslims versus uh, atheists uh, versus agnostics um, versus Buddhists, um, and and these these would still be encyclopedia articles, right? Um, so um, they they aren't they wouldn't be intended to be um, opinionated uh, introductions from each point of view. That's not the point. Um, uh, but you would be able to see maybe this sort of alignment of of series of histories that they each have, exactly. and, and the way that actually, they talk about they God agree? or talk about their 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 myth their mythic you know growth. Where do they agree is actually one of the most interesting questions that we'll be able to ask, or rather to have answered. Um, so um, you know, I love that I love that Larry because you know mm -hmm. now we're talking about helping our children and helping ourselves yeah. see what critical thinking looks like, right? Because that's yeah. what it's, you're supposed to compare and contrast. It's a part of the critical thinking process. Exactly. And if you exactly. have no way to compare because you just don't know where to pull this stuff to begin mm -hmm. with, you can't, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, just, just imagine, I, I was yesterday uh, doing another podcast interview, actually, with a guy who uh, had a, a PhD in, in uh, Islamic history, um, and he's written some uh, books about that subject, uh, one of which is just on, I, I believe, on the concept of jihad. Um, and uh, he, he was basically shadow banned from Facebook um, because he used the, the word jihad and you're just not supposed to or something, uh, which, yes, is, is, which is absolutely yeah. absurd. I mean, it doesn't even begin to make sense. And of course, it's a thing. Um, it's a thing in the world. Uh, and, yeah, and proper all usage kinds of a word in discussion and not in hate is a totally different thing. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, okay, I don't know his case fully, so maybe maybe he represented, uh, misrepresented uh, how, I, I, I doubt it, I think he probably, he, he was a, a straight shooter, but maybe he misrepresented it and there was more to it than that. But here's the point. Um, there could be... Um, a really interesting discussion to be had if we simply compare the uh, top-ranked articles about jihad 
from uh, you know compare the 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 one that would be uh, approved by um, imams, right? On the one hand, and the ones that would be approved by Western scholars of Islamic history, on the other hand. And then how about um, uh, um, foreign correspondents that cover the Middle East, right? right? If you could actually prize apart those different groups and then look at how the articles about jihad differ and, and are similar, um, it, you know, then no longer would anyone be able to come up with an absurd policy, which said, you know, uh, Just putting this word in means you're out. <laughs> yes, exactly. There's, and I think that the, that would be doing the world a great service. Uh, basically, if we can demonstrate where we agree, um, then that I think we agree on a hell of a lot more than than um, than we uh, than we want to let on. Even so like you, Christians you and Muslims, the they agree on a hell of a lot. They actually yeah. do. This um, is true. So do. do do you think that some of the problems, though, are being exacerbated by the artificial intelligence, you know, the, the algorithms, the bots that they're utilizing at, just to be efficient at the levels of social media, right? So they're, you know, they're trying to just go through this, like, simple scraping. If this word shows up, get rid of it. If they appeal, then it goes through the group and we'll have a, we'll, you know, we'll take a look at it. Um, well, it looks like it looks that way. I mean, yeah. having having written a few algorithms in my time, I, I, I find it hard to believe that it would be that simple. But yeah, I mean, they, they're that's definitely... how it feels on the other side to the no, I know. You know, writing. It absolutely like, is. Why is this ad not approved, or why did my article not get pushed out? It, you yeah. know, a lot of times, it's oh, look at the language in that. Oh, but I'm talking about that critically. I wasn't talking about it. Uh, so, uh, right. so one of the issues is is that if we post uh, lots of social media and the new trust economy. Um, if we post about Bitcoin, mm -hmm. if we, which, you know, we don't always talk about, we do talk about cryptocurrency occasionally, but mostly mm -hmm. on the tokenization side of things. But if it does, those um, posts are significantly downgraded. You can see our general traffic, but if yeah. it happens to men mention Bitcoin, it doesn't happen. And, it, it's a really, you know, it, I just look at that and go, there has to be something there. I mean, this doesn't. They're going to be changing that soon, though. I heard. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it probably will be. But yeah, you know, the, that's an interesting thing that we're coming across because I'm a, I'm a, I would say I'm not a, I'm not an anti AI if, in the articles that I write. I think that there's a really interesting place for artificial intelligence and machine learning, but it requires diversity. Mm -hmm. It requires critical thinking built into it. It requires that compare and contrast and women and minorities right. and other groups to get involved in it. And when we don't have that, then it can become dangerous is the way that I look at it. Then it becomes, you know, arbitrary in how it feels applied to those of us on the other side. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. yeah. So, so Larry, you know, I, I'm excited about the future. What do you see? Let's talk just briefly before we go. What's mm -hmm. the future of blockchain? Where do you see it going? What needs to happen? It's, it's pretty, as you pointed out very before, it's, it's early, it's infancy. So yeah. what's next for blockchain? Um, I'm not necessarily the best person to ask about that. Um, I mean, I, I have a few things that I say when people ask me that. So one of them is um, the main reason why uh, a lot of dApps have not been accepted is that people have been working so hard on the blockchain side that they haven't worked very hard on the traditional, um, you know, UX and I, I agree with that. <laughs> other, yeah. other stuff that they need to. I mean, uh, you're, you you from the end user's point of view, you are, um, you're comp competing with non-blockchain uh, solutions to people's problems. And the blockchain component doesn't really solve very many problems for the average user. Um, so basically, uh, you have to be at least as good as the existing um, uh, offerings or whatever you're trying to do and then blockchain becomes the differentiator that makes it actually better. So that's actually what we're trying to do with Everpedia. Um, 
I, I hope I hope we will be an example. But I, whether or not we are, I do think that in the next couple of years, there's going to be um, more and more breakout products, basically, that demonstrate the value of blockchain. Um, I think I, uh, I see it too. That's that's mm-hmm. kind of our take here and our look on that is that there are a lot of things coming that are demonstrating the the, the value of blockchain and, and how it's really going to be a better foundational structure. Yeah, yeah. I'm look, looking forward to, to um, uh, the EOS is supposed to be launching some social media network or something. I'm not really sure. They're very vague. Um, and uh, on January, uh, June 1st, um, that should be interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, last year, obviously, we had a, a big bear market. I actually noticed that just the sheer numbers of invitations that I got to speak. <laughs> just dropped off the second half of last year um and then uh now it's like back way up picked back up again i know i know absolutely so So, well uh, well dr larry sanger thank you so much for coming on the show i really appreciate everpedia.org is the website we'll have all the links to that in the show notes for this blog uh the show notes blog for this podcast and this video cast um at newtrusteconomy.com Thank you so much again, Larry. Really appreciate it. I'm so glad we got to talk more and, and get to know each other a little better and, and get to debate a little bit of philosophy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was my pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah, thank okay. you. Everyone, thanks so much for joining us here on the New Trust Economy. You've been listening to the New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring the new trust economy with us.